appreciate it. I have a feeling, well, I hope more people are going to drift in. If you don't know me, I'm Sarah Holland, I'm the ministry intern. Um, as you, people have come in, there are cartoons, there are Shel Silverstein cartoons. We need to make sure everyone has one of those before we do our first thing. And while we're passing those around, yeah, if you ever come sort of help, make sure everybody gets one. Um, while we're passing those out, we can go and introduce ourselves as people in the front who are sort of here as some perspectives from the LGBT community. Um, so I'm Sarah, I'm an adult lesbian, here to we can chat about that, we will chat about that. My name is Eileen. I'm Sarah's classmate at um, BU School of Theology. I'm a candidate for ordination in the Unitarian Universalist Church, and I identify as queer. We'll talk more about that later. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, I'm David. I'm uh, also a student at Boston University after a long hiatus in all the church ministry. I identify as transgender, um, and we'll talk about that too. Hi, I'm Rich Caswell. I guess I'm also a student, but not at BU, but as a student of life. I'm the uh, co-chair, along with Susan, of the Open Youth Open and Affirming Community here in that parish of Offerdale. And I suppose on this panel, I represent the mainstream, if you will, middle-aged white gay man. <laughs> Are you 
a boy or a girl? This was yesterday. And I say, I'm a girl. And she says, well, I'm confused because of your shoes. And I said, well, I actually tried to get women's shoes, which I don't always try to get women's clothes. I actually tried to get women's shoes, but they didn't have any women's shoes. So I got the men's shoes. And she goes, and runs away. And I remember things like that when I was young, except, I mean, looking back, I look just like a little boy. Those things would hurt me. But in that instance, as a 26-year-old queer lesbian, I, I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty free with whatever, but um, I felt kind of proud of myself for breaking down the what she saw. I, I was proud of myself for making her be confused, and then of course I was like, well, should I be proud of that? And you know, there's this whole thing. Anyway, when I came out in the context of a relationship about five or six years ago, I, I do not remember referring to myself as a lesbian or gay for at least six months into my relationship. And I now see this not naming as what was serious internalized homophobia. Um, I'm sure that's what it was. So, also in the relationship, my girlfriend did not call herself a lesbian, but she identified as queer. When she and I moved to Roll Southern Oregon, it was then that I made some friends who I now refer to as my older hippie lesbian mentor friends. Um, these friends always tried to understand this, this idea of queer, but in a sense, I saw them wondering, why would you deny the fact that you're a lesbian? We've worked so hard for you to be out and proud, and here you are calling yourself a queer. <coughs> Within the past year, I've spoken more and more with people about the word queer, and now I struggle to understand in what ways it can and should be used. Some people I know hate that the LGBT community has taken the word queer and use it. But for other people I know, it's really the only way that they feel like they can identify. So in some sense, I see this as a dilemma of generations, but I also know that people's identities really are at stake. And so that's sort of the reason um, we're talking about this today, and that's all of it. in the Unitarian Universalist Church, which historically has been a very open and affirming um, place. Um, and I grew up with very liberal parents who, um, it, was, it was pretty easy to come out to my parents and to my church community. Um, nobody ever had uh, a really big issue. Um, I came out to my parents when I was 13 um, as bisexual, and um, they thought that that was great. And the people at my church thought that that was great. Um, and, and living in and moving through the circles that I've been privileged to participate in um, has been an easy way of, of being a queer person. Um, but when I leave those circles, um, I realize that that's not what the real world is always like. And language becomes um, really relevant to my existence. Um, and it, it's so interesting. So I identify as queer because um, I don't believe that there are only two genders. Um, I think that people have the right to identify their gender however they would like. And so I don't like the word bisexual because that implies that there are only two genders. Um, and I love people for who they are, not based on their genitalia. Um, so for me, I prefer the word queer. And, and queer has a whole host of meanings for me because Queer isn't just about um, the partner that I happen to have. Um, queer is about my life and the choices that I make in challenging uh, the norms that society um, puts, puts onto people. Um, now, I am in a committed relationship with a male-bodied person who identifies as a man. So when we walk in the street, we look heterosexual. Uh, and so for me, that language becomes even more important in coming out um, consciously over and over again and, and identifying that part of myself to people because otherwise I will be invisible. Um, and I don't think that that's healthy. I think it's really important uh, for queer people, especially
especially for people who look as if they're straight people, um, to be out so that people know that they know a, a queer person or an LGBT person, and they, they can like that person and love that person and think that that person is great. Um, what else do I want to say about language? Um, great. So, um, growing up in the Unitarian Church and also existing in the communities that I exist in, like at the School of Theology, which is a very uh, progressive community, and uh, working in intentional communities I've lived in, uh, intentional communities, <coughs> like a co-op uh, or like a commune. Um, uh, uh, something of great value is asking people how they identify, um, and asking people what kind of language they would like to have used. Um, you, you can't assume something based on the way that someone looks. Like, I, I appear to be a heterosexual person, but that's not actually true. And I think it's a way, in Unitarian Universalism, we have seven principles that we, um, it's sort of like our doctrine. Uh, we don't have any doctrine, but it's sort of like our doctrine. One of them is the inherent rhythm and dignity of every person. And I think that asking people, how would you like to be referred to? Um, would you like me to refer to this person as your partner, or your girlfriend, or your boyfriend, or your husband, or your wife? How would you like me, me to interact with you? I think, for me, that's a way of, um, accepting people, uh, the way that they come to you, and, and acknowledging their inherent dignity and their worth. Uh, so language is, is really important to me. Um, well, I've told you a little bit about me in the sermon, uh, so I guess I'll just uh, restrict my comments around language. Probably being a little older than Sarah and Eileen, Greer has a lot of different I think I understand that today is more a political term uh, for trying to help people move beyond the binary. I identify as transgender, uh, and, and I take my language from uh, Virginia Ramey Mollicott's omnigender work with the gender continuum. Uh, as I mean said, I mean, there's not just one or the other, there's a whole range of, of gender identities and orientations, and we all fall somewhere along. I place myself at a very extreme end. I identify very much as a heterosexual male, transgender male, and uh, that's how I live my life. Some of my friends are much more on the uh, gender queer side. Um, and so I, I agree, I think the most important thing is to ask people what their preference is. In, in my church meetings, when we have committee meetings and the straight board meetings, one of the things we started to do would be to go around the room and ask just name and preference of pronouns. It was very painful to grow up as a transgender person with the wrong pronouns. I hated it. And by the time I was in fifth and sixth grade, I was arguing with my teachers why all dogs were male, all cats were female, and we live in such a gender world. And we're like, give me a break already, you know? Everything doesn't have a gender. And, and, but the, this constant genderizing of our world is what I try to challenge uh, when I work with people. And the mutual respect of asking what people prefer and honoring that. Because it's true, we don't always identify with how we appear. And so uh, helping people be identified as they would prefer, I think, is one of the first and most important steps. I think when, um, when Sarah asked me to be on the committee, and part of it was considering our open <coughs> committee, uh, I probably said, well, I'm not entirely sure I'm on the same page as you are. And she's like, perfect, so why don't you be on the group? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, and I agree with the full uh, appreciation of gender identity and expression. And I suppose, you know, and I tried to do a little bit of homework. I had a lab meeting uh, and on Tuesday, the lesbian advocates and defenders, they defend on behalf of transgender and other uh, marginalized folks in the legal system and fought for marriage equality, et cetera. And I was talking to one of the one of the women there who is um, lesbian. She goes, you know, we kind of took back that term dyke, you know, we kind of owned it. And I guess it's a way to take something that has a negative connotation and owning it. And last night I quizzed some of my, it was like 14 of us, all guys, we took like it was the Kiwanis Club at the, <laughs> end, the Heart House, which is really nice if not then. Really nice. So I mentioned to them, I said, well, what do you guys think about the term queer? And we 
you know, a lot of us that are, you know, in their 40s and then some guys in early 50s, we find it really off-putting because it was a way to be really derogatory when you were younger to say queer or fag or other of these terms that were kind of bullying type terms that were really, um, for, the, for those of us in this generation, found really offensive. And so, but, you know, a few folks admitted, yeah, the younger folk, younger people are sort of taking that on and sort of owning it and kind of redefining the meaning of that. So, and, and I understood that Jim, who was just turned 50 a few years ago, was saying, you know, I, I, I get you, I totally understand we're on the same page. But, so anyway, I did a little bit of homework and tried in understanding at two different uh, occasions this week. But I think it is because, as you mentioned, with the lesbian folks with whom you were communicating, um, there was a lot, of, like, a lot of struggles to try to get acceptance and it was almost a strategic initiative, and people somewhat disagreed with this a lot with the groups that I'm part of, with, well, let's get some mainstream acceptance. It's a little easier to digest, if you will, and let's move in that direction. And in some cases, transgender folks got a little bit marginalized within the gay, lesbian community until certain groups like that felt they were comfortable with moving in that direction because sort of felt society wasn't ready. But I understand, you know, that, you know, sometimes I've concluded this, a lot of younger people haven't quite figured it out yet, but I understand, you know, the notion that perhaps um, it has a different meaning today in redefining it than it did, well, you know, when many of us were coming out in the uh, 80s and 70s. So, we want to open up the floor. Child experienced the wrong puberty. 
is it's a lot more painful and it's a lot more difficult afterwards medically to go through the transition. And so um, they could they can access good care and good um, counseling advice through those organizations. Well, how do you get the parents to get to a place where they even consider? Because by doing that, they have to they have to get them to a point where they're going to say, yes, transgender is a real option or a real. I hear you saying, though, that they're already saying they're afraid it is. That, and that, that, and that is a term that, that yes, they have given me. But, so but it's what, a fear. But I, would, I guess I would bring back to them, how do you prevent your fears and from um, affecting this child's life to the point that your fears are going to prevent them from uh, having access to care that will help them in the long run. So they need to kind of work through that fear. And, and TIFA and Trans Youth Family Allies, um, they could help the parents as well. Because it's not just resources for the the identified person. So it has to be the parents first, yeah. because they're making decisions exactly. for this child, which is the hard part. So, so if, I, if you I think get resources, I'd be glad. All right, I will talk with you after this. Thank you. I actually also have a, um, I just happened to, I just grabbed some resources I have. Pinwheels is this organization that's based in the Methodist Church, but it's just a group for families with, don't, don't even call the children transgender, Families with gender non-conforming children, and it sounds like definitely couldn't argue. I mean, that's they could hear that a exactly. Lot Maybe they could hear it easier. And this is just essentially. I think these these families just email back and forth because they're all over the country. So I can this Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great example of language use. Yeah. That totally. Right. I'm wondering. I, I heard some years ago that there is. Um, a fairly good percentage of children who are born with ambiguous mm -hmm. sexual equipment. And um, I'm just wondering if you have any statistics about that and, you know, I know how that is treated by, do by doctors sure. nowadays. Well, and yeah, it's a great question. I, I don't actually know a percentage, but I do know that, I mean, I think the correct term or the most, I guess, most positive and accepted term is intersex. Right. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And, um... About one in 1,500. What? That's, so that's pretty, that's a pretty good degree. That's, that's, that's a lot. Just, just one quick thing. I noticed in the news the other day in Germany, they are now beginning to talk about um, child identification at birth. On the birth certificate, you can get male, female, and undetermined. Right, so, and that's the other thing I was going to say is you said, how are doctors dealing with this? And I think the problem, or what I see as the problem, is that generally it's not being dealt with. It's M or F, and that's it. Because that's sort of the box that the doctor is in. So I don't know if that's in the near future here. Do you, do you all know any more about that? Uh, we, we have a friend who's a, a doctor, a pediatrician, who told us that in his earlier years of practice, it was very common for babies to be operated on without the parents' knowledge, even wow. in his practice. And that's not that long ago. No. Today, that's much less common. There's a more, there's a movement towards um, just working with the families and, and just trying to see how the child grows up without doing that invasive surgery. But for years, the parents didn't even know. <laughs> My name is John, and I'm a physicist, and that self-identification is irrelevant when I ask you for advice, uh, which is actually very <coughs> good. So, um, uh, recently I was, uh, I joined uh, something called the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study as a venture faculty member. And uh, the idea is that we do a lot of cross-disciplinary work. And I think my, my hunting license was cross-disciplinary work in the sciences. <laughs> and so I find myself in this group of academics, many of whom are humanists, and I'm isolated by their language and my language. And what I've found is that a lot of times with the humanists, there are social issues that percolate for a while, and then they become targets of academic study. Um, and um, so 
uh, last weekend I was ushering and I saw that you were um, going to talk this weekend and, and do this thing. And um, we had a meeting on Wednesday coming up where we we're going to talk about our annual gender studies conference. I said, oh, I actually have something to contribute. Uh, <laughs> I felt like I was completely like a fish out of water uh, with the bicycle. Um, in any case, uh, in any case, I ride my bike in and out of work, you see. So, um, so I went to this, this meeting and uh, it was dominated by the humanists and they were speaking this language that I could not, you know, jam into with my elbows or anything because it was all these, these words that were very specific to the humanists and that sort of stuff. So I just couldn't get a word in edgewise because I didn't even understand. But I remembered the language and social justice on the thing in the, um, uh, in the flyer for last week. So I, so I waited patiently for 90 minutes through this thing, not saying a word. And then they got to the gender conference thing. And uh, the, the dean, Liz Cohen, said, ah, why don't we do something about gender in the workplace, where she meant gender was a buzzword for women in the workplace. And the issue then was that, in my mind, this was a topic which had been chewed over so much that it's, it's not terribly fresh if you're going to try to do something new. So I said, ah, well, what about transgender? language and social justice, because these were the only words that I actually had. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I, so I threw that out, and then all of a sudden the humanists looked at me and nodded. Like, oh, yeah, he's, he's one of us, he understands. <laughs> quite honest, I was just throwing out the only words that I, that I, that I knew. So, so, so God bless the UPA for, for doing this. But it was, I was, it was less than being totally facetious, okay, because, because it, it struck me that, that Radcliffe had kind of gotten into a, a gender rut in some sense, because it was gender, meaning women, and what issues that, that, that heterosexual women face, you know, in the workplace and this sort of stuff, and you keep churning that over and over again, and it just struck me that, you know, transgender issues, you know, you sort of see this, this issue where there was feminism in, in the 60s and 70s, and women had to overcome a lot of barriers, and then, you know, I think, uh, gay and lesbian people, you know, had a lot of barriers and they, they had to overcome. So it seems like, you know, transgender issues are, are, are still kind of very much, you know, in, in a much more, I don't know, evolutionary phase, especially with language, with regard to language. So the, the, the question now is, when I suggested this, some people thought it was a good idea, but a lot of people were actually very much against it. And Liz Cohen, the dean, said, this is a little bit too raw to go and study this. And we also have a, a conference that's coming up on, um, on um, transgendered people. And the person I'm working with who's been tasked with that has no idea what to do either. And so, you know, it just struck me that because it's so new and there are all these issues of language surrounding it and identity, that it actually could be very fruitful in, in the sense that it is cross-disciplinary and it is sort of getting Radcliffe out of its rut, if you like. And so the issue is, is it really too raw to, to have a discussion among people and academics about the topic? I mean, or, or, or is it something that we, we, could, we could imagine doing? I mean, uh, too, too raw in terms of uh, mixing gender and trans um, I think Liz was worried about <coughs> protests or something like that, or, or, or collisions. Or, I'm, I'm not really sure what. I mean, it, it struck me that it's, it's new enough that, you know, I, I only heard the word cisgendered recently, right. and I understand the, the intent of the word cisgendered versus transgendered, and I know that language has evolved. I mean, lesbian was a reference to Sappho a long time ago, but it's now acquired its own, you know, sort of identity. And so the evolution of language and the social issues and the evolution of culture are kind of intertwined. And it just struck me that, you know, without putting any kind of, you know, valence on it, it actually is, is a really interesting topic of itself, but a lot of social justice issues. So it seems like it's very rich, and, and one could, you know, elevate it to that kind of status. Well, yeah, and, and I think those kind of conversations are going on. I mean, it's a lot of uh, talk, talk, and conversation around intersectionality of oppression, um, because people are beginning to see, you know, if one population is being persecuted and oppressed, chances are others, other groups are resonating or experiencing similar things. So we're starting to talk more together. But what you're describing, I think, was one of the things that was difficult for me to experience uh, coming, going back out into being so public was um, the T, the trans, is always at the end. Mm -hmm. We're always just tagged on. Mm -hmm. And there's no real conversation. 
Um, and so there's a lot of, there's been a lot of pushback among gay and lesbian people towards transgender people. Uh, feminists were some of the hardest on trans people for a number of years. The really radical, uh, exclusionary feminists that don't accept transgender people. So there's a lot of conversation that needs to happen. And, and I do think, um, predominantly when you see gender anywhere as an issue, it's specifically women as gender. And I don't know how to touch that yet. I've been trying to figure that out myself because I, I certainly don't want to um, back away from the, how critical women's issues are. But how do you include transgender issues? Because we don't belong in sexual orientation. We belong as a gender identity, but we have no place. And so it's still that experience of the T or the Q is kind of being tagged on. And so I think those are con those conversations you're talking about them are very important to start because we've got to start because because transgender people are kind of still bad at the, at the 80s level. Yeah, exactly. Are there any resources? I mean, books or, or papers that I could show my colleagues? Because I mean, I I really like to not back away from this completely because I think there, there is a need to, to to raise it. So maybe I don't know. You, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the card because I, I, I can give you a lot of links. Okay, great. We also had uh, Joanne Herman was here at one point and she wrote the book Transgender Explained. So in terms of just understanding more about that from the basic level. But uh, I also wanted to sort of tag on to what you said because I think um, even within the gay lesbian community originally, um, transgender folks have been marginalized. And there was a lot of, you know, that originally there was a great deal of thought that and you could say it was the privileged uh, accepted, that were like, oh, you know, the mainstream, if you will, for lack of a better term, gay and lesbian folks wanted to be accepted. It was a little more palatable. And there are some folks, and you live in here today amongst some, some gay and lesbian folks, like, oh, that's, we don't want them part of the group because, you know, we really fought really hard and that's a little out there. And so we, as well, have, a ways to go, and I think we've come a long ways with respect to that. I mentioned even the organizations that didn't tackle it um, originally or make it as inclusive as it could have been. And so I think the point that you're bringing up is in part that is a little bit of a discriminatory notion that, um, <coughs> that may be a little too radical, a little too out there. But I think increasingly, you know, there are real issues that families are dealing with with gender expression and identity, potentially trans, maybe not. But I think that. It's real, and the, and the notion of compassion and love, and kind of like what the sermon had taught, is, is a great one. And understanding that, okay, you know what, this is all part of being marginalized and have a similar path in that respect, and in that way, we can all relate and it makes sense. So, anyway, I understand you know, what, what your colleague is suggesting, and also what the struggle of having a tag, tag on. I also just want to quickly offer um, to you, John to think about maybe your experience as being a Christian in a room full of humanists um, and what that marginalizing language felt like to you as um, maybe what it feels like for an elementary school child to be in the classroom and have their teacher using all these gendered pronouns and things like that. Like, for example, when I lived in India and I was the only white person in my whole city, I realized that I had never felt that way before. And uh, this can be a really great opportunity for you to um, sort of learn, learn what it means to be in solidarity with people who feel that way Every day. Oh, oh I, I, I've already. <laughs> <laughs> it occurred to me in the very first meeting. <laughs> because what happened was I was, I was not only a humanist, but I was, I was a minority male. And, and so what, what, happened, <laughs> what happened was that the whole discussion sort of took on a humanist uh, female Great. tinge to it, and, and, and I didn't know the language at all. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> I, already, I already got it. <laughs> Uh, David Walsh. Uh, what I wanted to say here is, I think with the transgender um, revolution, it's, it's such a smaller portion of the total population, and I, I gotta agree uh, that there's a lot of ignorance out there, and I think a discussion like this is just awesome. And if we could just get this thing going, and get more people um, educated. Yes. I love that. <laughs> I'm gonna, after yours, I think I'm gonna, or let's take Hannah's and then yours, and then I'm gonna wrap it up because okay. there are other things happening at UPA, and I just really want us to be respectful of that. Um, 
so we need to. Um, my name is Hannah. I'm a nurse, and I currently work with um, people who are very chronically and psychiatrically ill, um, who are kind of at their low point. And I have some patients who identify as transgender and have um, gone to their medical providers and their psychiatrists and talked about it. And the response has really been, we can't address that yet until we get you healthy. We can't address that yet if you're so depressed that you're suicidal. If you're having heart attacks, there's no way you can have hormone therapy and that sort of thing. And this whole discussion has made me wonder if, if our priorities are wrong um, and, and if you know putting that to the top of the list is the way to best treat them. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. I just have one sentence. Um, I'm in Christian education or um, religious education. I just attended a class yesterday in which we went through CE basics and one of the handouts we received is how to talk about the Bible lessons being respectful versus not talking gender, but and we have a whole, we just received it yesterday, so I just wanted to share with you, because uh, Sarah and I have been working with trying to make it, our Sunday school much more, uh, you, you know, gender neutral. Gender neutral, there you go. <laughs> and, and I was trying to find a way, we were, we've been trying to find a way to do it and still be respectful for what we're doing. And we got, I did receive instructions last, yesterday at a class, so I'm going to share, I will be sharing that with you, so. Yeah, that's, so, that's excellent. And I, what I was going to say to Hannah was that, I mean, no, none of us really responded. It's, there's really like, a, there's a system that, I mean, with any marginalized population, you're still working within a system and you have to. So I don't, I mean, I don't have solutions. I know there are resources and that, Maybe in like in your everyday life or interactions with people in the church, you could maybe advocate for these folks and say, "Hey, you know, like I think there may be some resources we should look at that could be educational." I mean, I'd, I'd love to try to help, like help you. I, I guess I'd like to say, you know, that um, if there's a way to um, influence the, the folks you work with or bring in some outside resources. Because I've worked with um, quite a few transgender people who are grappling with that later in life, like in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and some of the physical symptoms that they're having, or that some of them have had, disease processes, were really caused by the stress of being trans <laughs> that wasn't being addressed. And once they started to address those issues, other health problems began to clear up and then they were able to go on the hormones and they were able to move forward. So you're right, the, getting the things in the right order is so important. Um, and then the other thing I just want to say was that um, earlier in the week I got a copy of the bulletin for Sunday <coughs> that I printed off. And so as I was looking at it and, and I read on the statement, uh, transgender wasn't on that particular week's welcoming statement. And so I, I thought, oh my gosh, what's my name? Can I tactfully say it from the pulpit? No, there's probably no way to do it. And so I, I emailed Sarah and I mentioned, you know, I just noticed that transgender was left off here. So this morning it's in, you know, your bullet that has the version that has the transgender. And I think Sarah, you're the one that said, well, we have different versions and we put different ones in. Yeah, my understanding, I think we, we talked about it in yeah. the our last yeah. open and affirming yeah. meeting. And the, I think over the years, I guess the blurb has, has changed. Yeah, right. But that doesn't make it okay. But I, don't I, would, think, I don't think it makes it okay. What I, that's what I wanted to say. That for me, as a transgender a person, to come in and to read the statement that has everybody else in it, but not me. Really speaks volumes, and then to see that this morning I'm in movement. <laughs> so that's um, that's just language. I would um, like to comment that first of all, an apology. I've been dealing with this, and I think this is someone's weird computer glitch because the, the uh, God's honest truth. <laughs> um, transgender was in there a long time ago, and then every once in a while, someone would say, "Wait a minute, it's not in there." I would say, "Go back to the secretary and." and whoever the minister was to say, this isn't in there, well, say, yes, I've changed it, which I know that they had because those people were on our committee. 
and then <laughs> it would be in there, and then it wouldn't again. So I don't know if it's something that keeps popping up from before. So yes, originally it was not in there, but I know that it has oh, struggled with this. So my apologies, but I know that it was in there. <laughs> I wonder if it's because a bulletin will be pulled up. Yeah. And they just change, yeah. they cut and paste, not, re not realizing. I wanted to, I know we're coming to a close, and I think this, and I think this will maybe help. So, so part of, uh, you know, I'm really proud of the church and a number of the things that it's done within the GLBTQ uh, community. Uh, and, and it's really something with which I think we all should be proud. And, I, and so in so doing, I put a Facebook update during it, and I said, and I, and I wanted to share this because I think it gets to language and also basically, basically what you had said in asking people. So I said, you know, we had this great um, sermon. It was an awesome sermon. So thanks. Um, by, this, uh, by, by a transgender clergy. And I got an email immediately said, by the way, Rich, it's transgender, not transgender clergy. And I showed it to David, and he's like, yeah, that's correct. And without questioning or asking folks the way they like to be talked about or say, well, I said, well, help me to understand that because I sometimes just say transgender person. And, and, you know, we had a little conversation. And the reason why I bring that up is not to be a PC police to tell you what to say and not to say, but it's in conversation and asking people because I am educating myself about, you know, and really the way to do that is just to talk to people and ask them how they like to be referred because I didn't have it. Right, and luckily they have an edit function, and I just took off the name. But <laughs> we're good. We're good. But it was, I just wanted to share that with you because that's the notion of this group is about language and appropriate language and talking to people the way with which they like to be communicated with, right? Sort of the platform rule. Yeah. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's give them a.